So before I kind of get started, I want to get a pulse on the room. Who owns an e-com brand? Could you put your hand up? Okay, keep them up for a second. Out of all of you, who has majority of their ad spend on Facebook right now? Okay, about half. And then out of you guys, because I know Black Friday, Cyber Monday kind of varies based on like if you're retail, if you're not retail. Out of you guys, major, well, like who has majority of their income coming these last two months from the year? Put your hands up. Okay, very interesting. Just like spitballing out out of the rest of you that didn't put your hands up, like why does most of your money not come these next two months? Anyone? What? What's your product? Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, we have a lot of dietary brands and January, February is way better than Q4. Okay, cool. You? What is your what is your product? I got you. Okay, cool. Well, a um, couple things I'm going to be talking about today, just so you guys kind of have an idea of what we're going to be covering. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to leave some questions for Q and A because everyone has different products, everyone has different situations. I'd rather kind of hash a lot of things out. Um, first thing I'm going to talk about the current state of advertising. We advertise on probably like seven different platforms right now. Uh, and we see companies that advertise on other platforms. So I'm going to kind of walk you through what the reality check is. A lot of us are in our own businesses and everyone looks like they have greener grass and everyone looks like they're doing amazing and iOS doesn't affect them. And these things are all lies, I promise you. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through what that looks like. And then whether or not you depend on Black Friday, Cyber Monday, I'm going to show you five strategies that we're doing right now that are absolutely going to change the game this year. And for people who are Q1 heavy, you can implement these same exact things January, February, um, and see the same kind of results. So a lot of you guys are seasonal. It doesn't really matter. It's just whenever that prime time of the year is, this is kind of a couple of things that we're doing to two, three X the income that we're supposed to generate. So you sure it doesn't work? All right, so I'll start with Facebook since about half of you um, kind of had your hands up on Facebook. These are kind of the things that are actually working on Facebook right now. I just bullet pointed them out just to make it very easy for you guys. Broader targeting over, you know, more defined targeting. Six months ago, 1%, 2% lookalikes. I'm going to get really technical here with you guys. 1%, 2% lookalikes were like smashing it right now. 7, 8, 9, 10% lookalikes are doing better than our 1, 2% lookalikes across the board. What's happened essentially is the algorithm was actually kind of carrying a lot of companies. Um, and so now that that's gone, it's a lot harder to find buyer intent people. So the smaller your audience gets, the, the, it's like 10x harder almost. So the smaller your audience is, 10x of a chance less that they're going to find buyer intent people. So you'll notice even add to carts on websites the ratio of add to carts to purchases has declined heavily. So we used to see like 30%, 35% on a lot of sites when they add to cart actually end up checking out. Now we're seeing like 15 to 20%. So buyer intents dropped heavily and we've noticed broader targeting has been a lot more effective. So that being said, from a technical standpoint, we used to test a lot of audiences. We used to say, hey, I'm gonna run you know, 50 audiences wide, and I wanna see which one of these audiences is the one that's gonna stick, which one of these lookalikes, all these different things to try to find those pockets. In reality right now, what's actually happening is we're moving our testing of a very, very deep level to the creative side. So we've been all in on creatives. I'm hiring like a new videographer and editor basically every week at this point, because that is kind of where all the ad accounts are starting to depend on. They're depending on what catches attention. I'm gonna show you exactly the strategies that we use what the outline is of the videos and what makes them work. <laughs> Another thing, if you haven't done so for your companies, open up a ton of ad accounts starting now. There's ad limits now that we didn't have before a year ago, uh, which are kind of hindering how much we can test these creatives uh, just because Facebook limits how many ads you can have per account. So just something important to know. And I'll show you an example of this next one, like clickbait headlines with no ad copy. This is working really good for us right now, surprisingly, kind of back to the broad point at the beginning. What we're seeing is we just want the click. Whereas before on Facebook, we used to work really hard trying to get people to be super educated on the ad, give them long form ad copy, get them kind of drawn in and then have that higher buyer intent. But Facebook isn't doing a good job finding that high buyer intent for us right now. So we're kind of, 
when we're, when we're going A-B testing here, and we're testing like copy that's really good versus an ad that just has a headline, no copy whatsoever. We're coming out even. Sometimes the ad that has no copy whatsoever just with a headline is actually performing a lot better than the other ads. So just some things to, to test. I used to audit accounts and be like, why in the world do you not have ad copy on these ads? But now times have kind of changed and we're kind of seeing a small shift to those things working a lot better. And I'll show you some examples. If you have a lot of products, like her over here, sounds like she has a lot of products. Um, dynamic product ads have been killing it. This is kind of like the only thing in the Facebook algorithm that still works, FYI. Um, so if you do have a ton of products and you can kind of segment them out into collections, things like that, run dynamic product ads as much as you possibly can because this is the only thing that Facebook still kind of can optimize in a certain way from what we've seen. And landing pages have become an absolute must. I work with some of you guys in this room. You know that. We've kind of shifted everything away from websites. I've hired more copywriters than I've ever had to hire because we just need to pump out landing pages as quickly as possible, be able to split test those things. And I'll get into in the next slides kind of like what my conversion rate to average order value formula is to feel like something's gonna be able to scale successfully. But again, a lot of it's really dependent on conversion rate nowadays because we don't have control of the platforms like we used to. And that can change in the future. And realistically, I think um, Apple is going to release an update of some sort that's going to crush everyone else. And they're going to have their own ad platform that no one's seen anything like it before because all that data was coming from iOS, at the, from Apple at the end of the day, not from Facebook. So they still have all that data. We just don't have a way to access it to run ads. And then last thing, which is kind of the theme of this slide, if you haven't noticed, Facebook sucks. So the less control I can give Facebook, the better off I am. So we've seen a lot, you know, like January to March, Facebook's like, make everything CBO, which for you guys that don't know, it's kind of letting Facebook play with a budget and say, I want to spend $10,000 today, spread it out the way you think. That's not working anymore because um, their data is wrong. So they're basing it off wrong data at the end of the day and it's just not working. So everything is ABO now, which requires more attention. In our business, just so you know, we limit five ad accounts on Facebook to one person. So no one can handle more than five because now times have changed and it requires a lot of manual labor and attention. Whereas, you know, 10 months ago, we used to be able to automate a lot of the process, handle 15 accounts per person, and it's not an issue. You can go to the next one. Cool. So just from a logical standpoint, I want you guys to start thinking of Facebook and Instagram ads like billboard and TV ads, okay? Um, stop trying to find the audience, find the hack, find these things, get back to actual market strategy. Like AJ Patel was talking about product market fit. Why does your market actually want to buy the product? What are the problems that they're having? What are the solutions that your product actually creates? And let's get back to the drawing board and figure out how we can actually convince these people to buy our products instead of just depending on shooting the shit on Facebook, which I've seen so much of from businesses that do ridiculous numbers. I don't even know how they make money. Um, let's get back to this. So again, test more ads, not audiences. I want you guys to get creative on your angles, try different angles, try different creatives. I'm going to show you a few examples of creatives. I got, I got the door. Um, and here's kind of some ways to find angles that smash. Okay. First way is on Amazon. There's so many reviews on Amazon. It's ridiculous. Um, most of you guys have a product that already is being sold on Amazon by someone else. It may be a different product. You might have a different competitive advantage. There are benefits to yours, and that's why you're in the market. But at the end of the day, the customer base is the same, okay? So go to Amazon, find all the reviews, good and bad. I literally have my team export these to Excel files. I have them find the most common traits, good or bad, and we list them out, and we make sure in all our ad copy, whether it's on the landing page, whether it's on the ad, whatever it is, we are mentioning these pain points. So even in our reviews that we put on the landing pages, you know, Sally said this, we're taking the points, all the bad points that we find on Amazon and saying, oh my gosh, finally one that doesn't do, you know, skincare, finally one that doesn't cause rashes on my face and does X, Y, Z as well. And it does this. And so we're basically allowing all the people that have already sold tens of thousands of these products to just answer all our problems for us. So this has been really monumental. You don't need to have expert copywriters to figure this out for yourself. And then second step, this is probably more viable if you actually have a customer base. Um, so if you've done some sales, you probably have like a list of 10,000 plus people at least. You can do an email survey, give them something huge, like a thousand dollar Amazon gift card. A lot of you guys can afford that. Give them something that's just like so good they have to enter a survey. 
um, and give them like a minute, two minute long survey with like some of these questions are really good ones as well. And you will find common factors. Um, so these are kind of two strategies that we use for copywriting that doesn't require our copywriters. Like, you know, Christina knows our copywriters literally work on weekends. They do hundreds of hours of research. This saves a lot of that. So try to implement these things, especially the Amazon one. And I think you'll start seeing your ads converting a little bit better. Okay, cool. So here's my formula. It's very simple. If you open up your Shopify store, your WordPress store, whatever it is, if you take the average order value times the conversion rate, so example, $50 AOV times conversion rate of 5%, that gives you 250, okay? So our goal as a company is basically to make sure no matter what, and we don't even take brands that have a lower number than this, these two numbers need to multiply to 250 plus. So if you have a $100 AOV and you have a 3% conversion rate, you're in the green, okay? If you have a $200 AOV and 1% conversion rate, kind of iffy. I guarantee you're going to have negative days, you're going to have positive days, and the only difference is going to be a 0.9 conversion on one day and a 1.2 conversion on the next day. So I think a lot of us are like freaking out, oh my gosh, Facebook ads sucks, all these things. This is the only thing that actually matters, and this is what makes you invincible to all these platforms. We have some clients that we run ads on Hulu. Like there is no tracking. There is no what is the ROAS at the end of the day? You have so much less control and they see so much success and it's because we know on their website, traffic is gonna convert at this percent and this is the average order value. And so it doesn't matter as long as we're bringing traffic in the target market that they want, they're gonna have a successful day. So just kinda wanna get back to the basics here. I know a lot of us like, <sighs> dude, me and Ashton, we're talking about it yesterday, we're like, dude, I wish we spent like tens of millions more dollars on ads the last two years now that we are in this situation. But now that we are in this situation, we gotta adapt quickly. Otherwise, you know, I've seen businesses literally go bankrupt the last six months. And this is kind of the core principle here. A lot of us are focusing on like, where can I run ads now? Let me run TikTok ads, let me try this, let me try that. But we're always focusing on spending money somewhere else. Whereas the reality is your store that's in the mall that everyone's walking into sucks. And so you gotta change what things are where, what is on what shelf, what is on what rack, what do people see when they first walk into your store? Get back to basic business principles rather than sitting here and trying to like hack your way across new ad accounts or platforms. Cool, and then this is another number that I really, really value. Six months lifetime gross margin. Um, so not six months LTV of a customer. If someone spends you know $600 on average in the first six months of being in business with you, that's not your gross margin, that's not your profit, and a lot of people look at that number and they're like, dang, customer spends $600, I can spend $200 to acquire them, it doesn't matter. But that's not the reality of the situation. So I want you as a business owner to take your P&L statements a little bit deeper and find out what the actual gross margin of a customer is after six months. Remove your cost of goods, remove everything, and figure out what that number is. Because I'll tell you right now, just based on the last week's event from Powerhouse, for the people that are members in the group, the ones that are like balling out, doing eight, nine figures consistently, all of them have one thing in common. They lose money on the first purchase, every single one. And the only reason is because they understand their lifetime gross margin in the first six months of a purchase. I asked the best people in the room, hey, how long does a customer stay with you? If someone subscribes, purchase one, they stay with us three and a half months. That means we have this much profit from this customer. So I'm willing to take a 0.7 return on my ad spend because I know I'll make the money 62 days in on the dot. And so these are important numbers as business owners that you guys need to know. It's kind of what AJ was talking about. Sometimes you just gotta clean up your business. And we kind of did things a little bit more loosely prior to iOS updates and these things because it didn't matter, whatever. We're making money, it's not a big deal. Now we kind of get a little bit more refined and gotta know our numbers to the dot. You'd be surprised how many times I get on an audit call with someone. They'll be like, yeah, we do 1.2 mil a month, and they don't know this number. So how am I, as a marketer, as an advertiser, supposed to know what our actual cost per acquisition should be if I can't even know what we're gonna profit from someone in the first six month period? So these are just important metrics that I think we're overlooking as business owners that we should start focusing on. Cool, so I'm gonna show you a couple cool video ads we recently made. I'm not gonna bore you to death with like 100 videos. I think I have like two or three. But this is the formula that we use, um, especially if someone's shooting videos with us the first time. These are the six things that we try to include across the board. I'd say social proof is probably one that's like in and out 
but everything else is is very kind of mandatory, especially top of funnel video ads. Okay, so eye catching hook probably the most important thing. People are scrolling through. I don't even know what the stat is at this point. Thousands of pieces of content a day. I think we're past hundreds at this point. Uh, just seeing my wife in bed alone, I think she goes through like 300 scrolls um, before she goes to bed. So like that's just bedtime. Point is, eye-catching hook is like the number one thing. It's probably 40% of the video. And I'll show you a couple of examples and you'll see the only thing that's in common out of all these guaranteed is eye-catching hook. But the best video ads that we've seen convert have a great hook. We talk about the product benefits or the pain points are kind of switched, right? So they could be in whatever order, two, three, four. It doesn't kind of matter what the order that they are in. We test all the time. So sometimes we put product benefits first. Sometimes we put pain point problem first. And we test against each other to kind of see from an ad standpoint, how much are people watching this? How many people are actually clicking through to this? Using metrics that are actually on platform that Facebook is not wrong about, like ROAS is and purchases and things like that. Social proof is a good one, but you'll see all the video examples I'm about to show you, none of them have social proof. That being said, UGC is becoming a part of actual retail outside of e-commerce. We have some big brands we shoot for that are not primarily making their money from Facebook. They make it from Target, they make it from CVS, Walgreens, all these other companies. And they're paying us not to shoot professional stuff anymore. I mean, they still do that, but they're paying us as well to shoot UGC. So like we're literally having actresses come in and say, oh my gosh, I got this product from Target and this is XYZ what it did. And now their product listing on Target has a girl talking on a cell phone, not a professional video talking about the product. So we're starting to see these things shifting in retail. I know Josh talked about it a lot, influencers, UGC, all these things. Just be conscious. I think a brand needs both, okay? Josh can't sell a $300 whitening kit if he only has UGC, if he doesn't have high quality photography, high quality videography, if he doesn't have these things. So you need a mix of both at the end of the day. You wanna make the brand feel expensive with the professional stuff, but you wanna make it feel tangible and used with the UGC and the kind of less professional feel. So. Next slide, again, so here, wait, before you play it, example, again, all these ads, strong hook. The first two videos is for a brand uh, for creatine. Now, just to kind of frame this for you so you understand, the, we are targeting people who already use this product. This is just a better product, okay? They're using running shoes and we came out with a better running shoe. Very similar situation, so that you understand why we're talking this way. If we are targeting people who we knew didn't know what this product was and didn't use it, the hook would be a lot different than what the hook is here, okay? Your creatine sucks. Gains in bulk instantized creatine is the world's first 100% So we get really visual right away after the hook. Since it's not There's fully like soluble, no way you can look at this and you can say this is not a better product cells, causing than negative the other side product like bloating, okay. excess water retention and chalky aftertaste that are commonly found in other creatines. The choice is clear. Make the switch to Gains in Bulk instantized creatine today. So again, the market that we're targeting was product aware, problem aware. They just were not aware of this specific product itself, right? So we targeted those people. And then in the next video, we did something similar. So for some of you buff guys here, I can tell. For pre-workouts, it's a hassle. You know, mixing your pre-workout, doing all these things before you work out every time. They came out with a chewable pre-workout. So we had to come up with a way to hook people on how can, like, what the fuck is happening in this video right off the bat. So you can play this. So now we're going through all the problems, all the things that people do to mix your workout, all the hassle they go through. So again, this is, this is very top of funnel, first time people saw this product. After they watch this video, they're getting retargeted by people who are actively using the product, talking about the chewable pre-workout, talking about how it made them feel in the gym, the results that they got, things like that. Next. And then this is a this is actually one of the powerhouse brands um, members, um, Early Bird. They have an awesome product. It's really cool. Actually, you all should buy it. Um, what it is, it's basically like um, 
it's like a morning cocktail is what they call it. And it's a replacement for like morning coffee, pre-workout, whatever it is that you take in the morning. You mix it the night before. You put it on your nightstand. And then when you wake up, you drink it. It's in this container that keeps it cold all night. Bomb product. My entire office is addicted to it. He just like ships us pallets every month at this point because they just like sneak. I catch people sneak in the back and like drink it in the morning. So this is an example of an ad that wouldn't have ad copy that would just have a headline that's super short 12 seconds long and you watch it and you're like what is this product i need to learn more you click it you go to the landing page the landing page is supposed to execute and do its job so <laughs> That's it. You're like, what's going on? 5 a.m. Cheat code to waking up early. Let me click and find out more. Okay. This ad did its job. That's all it was supposed to do was get you to say, fuck it. Let me click off Facebook real quick and let me just see what this is about. What is the cheat code? Why is it a cheat code? So very simple. So you guys don't need to overcomplicate things sometimes. I think it's very important to have a mix. Short ads, long ads, UGC, professional shot content. And I think a lot of us are kind of neglecting things. We're trying to ch keep reworking the same stuff that used to work in the past. And what we need to do as business owners is be a little bit more strategic and try out different things. Sometimes giving people less information than they need to hear is what actually gets them to click. You know what I mean? If you walk up to someone and you're you know, starting a conversation and they know everything about your life by the end of the first conversation, probably not interested in reconnecting at some point over the next couple of days. But if you have a little bit, you guys talk, you're curious more about each other, you guys will probably end up going to dinner tonight, et cetera. Same thing goes with ads. So sometimes it's good just to not give everyone all the information on the front end of things. Next. And then here's another ad I just want to put for shits and giggles just to show you guys some, some funny stuff. But we, we basically, you know, we did some market research. We figured out the target market of people who we are trying to target with these ads for this brand um, are all people who are like, in their mid 20s to mid 30s. That's kind of like the primary market we're going for. And all of them are very familiar with the old days, Mario, kind of that whole theme. They all played it at some point in their life or at least can recognize it by looking at it. So we shot this, this is pretty cool. We shot this on a green screen. This guy kind of faked the whole motion of the product. And then we have an animator on the team who used to work for Pixar. He went in and he like created an entire Mario, Mario level around alarm clocks, waking up early. So I'll kind of play it and then you can kind of see. Again, I don't need to sit here explaining what the ingredients are of the product. I don't need to explain too much about it. This ad is just meant to invoke people watching it and being like, what in the world is going on? Is this like Mario? What is happening here? And then throughout the process, it's only like 15 seconds or so. By the end of it, they're like, okay, like what is this thing? You know, what is this power up that this guy's taking? So very cool concept. And then next. And then now, now is the time to get more creative with your text on ads. Um, for all of you running ads, you know, like as of a few months ago, Facebook removed the limit of text on ads. It used to be 20% and it was a bitch and a half to sit there getting ads approved. We had to move things into little quadrants and make sure it was 20%. Now it doesn't really matter. So ads like this are really awesome. Sometimes big, bold letters on top of your images like this is what people actually want to see to kind of move to the next steps. So comparison of platforms here. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, it's easy to use. Everyone knows how to use it at this point. Doesn't require videos, con, everything else. We're all on the same page, I think. Um, Google, YouTube, very keyword based. This is like the best data out of all of them. If your brand is able to sell on Google and you're not, you should leave this room right after, watch some videos and get on Google ASAP. It is stupid the amount of money I see people leave on Google. Um, and an easy way to do that, if you are running Google ads, you can like change your filters on like the data you're viewing. There's one called impression share and you can see your percent of impression share on the words that you are targeting and then you can find those holes. So you can see like, oh, we're only 10% impression share on this keyword that's super important to us. We can kind of push our budgets and try to claim 90% of that impression share. Very, very, very undervalued platform. YouTube actually sucks right now. A lot of people are coming to us asking us to do YouTube ads and we're good at it. It takes like 
90 days to actually get to a point where like you're doing a good job. Um, but a lot of people due to iOS move to YouTube. Um, even one of my friends, Billy Jean, he has been YouTube for life, like the last five years. He spends like no money on YouTube right now. It's all on Facebook. Ironically, when we're all running off Facebook, he's running on because that's where he's actually seeing the ROI now because so many people are trying to get into YouTube and it's, it's really not as good as everyone makes it sound, but the intent is there. Snapchat, honestly, out of all these platforms right now, Snapchat's the worst one from an ROI perspective and you're all tricked to think it's a good one. Here's why. Snapchat actually automatically reports on a 28 day window. So when you're reading the dashboards or your marketing company is sending you a screenshot, we got you know a 2.5 ROAS this month, we killed it. It's actually on a 28 day window. So when you go and try to compare the data on like a seven day window or on a one day window, your ROAS is cut by like four or five X. So just be conscious if you are running Snapchat ads, when you click on your filters on the top right, you can see how is it viewing the data and change the window. Um, everyone's kind of told Snapchat's killing it, all these things right now because Facebook sucks. We are a creative agency. We have 15 people who hold cameras inside of our office. We have full on TV shows online, podcasts. We are content heavy and we make ridiculous amounts of content on Snapchat and we are good at it. And I'm telling you right now, it is the worst platform out of all five. So take that for what it's worth, okay? TikTok, very good trending upward right now. It's not there yet, but I'll tell you what's cool. And I have kind of a conspiracy theory on this. TikTok is the only platform out of all five that 100% reports data properly, 100%. And I think, I don't know, because China's so big and has so many iPhone users, behind the scenes, they've dealt something with Apple where they still report the data perfectly fine. I can on any day, on any hour, see the purchases that are reported in the TikTok dashboard, go to my Shopify store, and it will tell me TikTok sent this many purchases, and it's exactly the same every hour of every day. It's the only platform that is not wrong. So I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but for what it's worth, at least the data is there, which means the data can optimize properly. Facebook, you know, the data's not there. So it's optimizing for like fake things that actually aren't the way that they seem. TikTok is optimizing for things that are actually there. That being said, you need to, as, as a business owner, it's very important to segment all this traffic differently, okay? You guys are running emails, SMS, you have organic, you have influencers, all these things. Make sure you use UTM codes. If you guys don't know what they are, look them up. It's called UTM parameters. It's basically a code you put at the end of your link, which tells Google Analytics where all these things are coming from. I say that to say it's important to gauge what an actual expectation of a conversion rate is based on the traffic source. Example, from Facebook, 20% of people that add to cart, from what I see, actually end up buying something. Okay, from Google, it's a little bit higher, 35, 40% who click through a Google ad actually buy something. On TikTok, yesterday I was looking at one of our accounts that's very profitable, had like 18 purchases by like noon, and it had like 800 add to carts, like some ridiculous number. So you would look at your store that day and you'd be like, damn, my conversion rate sucks today. But in reality, your conversion rate doesn't suck. It's just because of the TikTok traffic that's coming through. Snapchat's very similar. It's not as bad as TikTok. But on days like that, when I, I know most of you guys have been doing this for a while, you can just look at the store, see how many visits are there that day, and just off the top of your head, know what your revenue should be. Like mine is one-to-one -one on most of my stores, for example. So if I have 10,000 visitors, then I have $10,000. And on days where I have 20,000 visitors and $12,000, I know we did something on TikTok, we increased our spend on TikTok or on Snapchat. So it's very important to be conscious of those things and just understand what the conversion rates are of each one. Don't expect the same from all these platforms. The world is completely different. These are different people coming, but there is opportunity on each of them at the end of the day. Last one's Pinterest. Very good platform, especially for like beauty brands, um, wall art companies, things that like people shop that are aesthetic and require some planning sometimes. That being said, it is a planning platform. It's not a purchasing platform. People don't go to Pinterest to buy something. They go to find stuff. It's a little bit different. So they go, they get ideas, they make their Pinterest boards with all their ideas, and then over the next few weeks, they actually make a purchasing decision somewhere else. So uh, we use TikTok. Uh, I mean, Pinterest is very top of funnel. And even Pinterest themselves, like if you get on calls with reps, they all say to report on a 30-day window, 
which for a lot of your businesses is probably pretty dangerous. But what's cool is if you segment your traffic properly, you can retarget on Facebook. You can retarget people who came from Pinterest specifically to that and then they'll click on you and then they'll be like, oh, I'm seeing this thing everywhere. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And then you'll see the conversion rate of that retargeting campaign is gonna be very high for you. So that's kind of what we use Pinterest for. Just kind of putting these up here. These are kind of the main sources of traffic. We do some native ads too, which is like Taboola and Outbrain and all these other sources, but you gotta have a kind of very specific business to do that. And then I'll tell you something that's very undervalued that in the next year, a lot of people will be spending more money on. Hulu ads, look into those. They're coming out with an ads manager, but Hulu ads right now are like one of the highest attention ads. People can't skip them. They're watching them on their TVs at night. They're watching them on their phones, on their iPads. A lot of you in this room watch Hulu. Girls, bachelorette, bachelor, like I know you watch Hulu. So like there's a lot of opportunity on Hulu and ads are getting interactive now too. So they're starting with interactive ads where you can like, the only way to get off the ad and move back to your show is to click something. Like you either have to go click skip ad or engage with the ad itself. And a lot of cool ideas I've been seeing is like, people will run their ad on like two thirds of the screen and then leave a QR code on the right third of the screen so that you can engage with it when you're watching. So like if you're like, oh, I really wanna buy that, you open up your camera, pulls up the link, you open it and then you go to your website. Um, very, very targeted, probably the best data out of everyone here except Google. It's ridiculous. They buy data from every single third party data company you can think of and they know everything. Like. I have friends that are personal injury attorneys for car accidents that spend boatloads of money. Like I'm, I've been managing their stuff for like five years or so. I can target people who are searching online for car accident attorneys through Hulu. Like that's how deep the data goes back, okay? So you can do whatever you want. You can target by zip code, by city. You can get very intense with this targeting. I'm not saying do it right now, but if you are a little more cash heavy and can afford like not an instant purchase every single time, this is a very big power play. Find your best markets, find out where people are buying. Hey, we have most of our purchases come from like Southern California or from Texas, whatever it is. Pull those markets and start running ads there and you'll be surprised kind of over the next few months what happens. Cool. So how to smash the shit out of Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Again, I, I noticed some of you guys aren't Black Friday, Cyber Monday heavy. You can still use this in your peak seasons. These are just really good offer strategies that are gonna kill it across the board. And we've used these for, uh, so for example, we have like uh, a Muslim jewelry brand. Their peak season is not Black Friday, Cyber Monday. It's whenever the Muslim holiday is, it's like their Easter. And so on those days, we use a lot of these strategies. And just this last April, we pulled in, by the way, their store does, you know, let's say 10 million a year. In one day, we pulled $1.8 million from these exact strategies right here. So they work, we've tried them on other stores. They work just as well, um, so just you know, keep that in mind. So a couple things that I'm seeing, everyone's starting earlier than usual, so no one's actually starting on Black Friday. Everyone's kind of doing things a little bit sooner this year. Uh, they're just not talking about it. So if you are running a sale and you're dependent on Black Friday and you're expecting to start on Black Friday, you're gonna lose. People are gonna run their prices to the floor this year more than I've ever seen. I've seen people discount things like 90% off across the board just to get customers in. There will be more inbound communications to customers than ever. There's gonna be 40 people texting them, 100 people emailing them. Everyone everywhere is trying to talk to your people at the same exact time over a five day period. So just keep that in mind. The sooner you can get in and get them to commit to listening to your stuff and looking in their inbox for your stuff beforehand, the more advantageous it's gonna be. And CPMs already, it's only like four days into November and they're already up from last month. So it's about to get pretty expensive in the next couple of weeks, just some things to keep in mind. So here's a few strategies that I think kind of work. So if you are building up and we can just take this as like a sale of some sort, okay? If you are building up to a sale of some sort for your company, you need to remove like all image ads right away. I'm talking, I'm very like Facebook heavy on this conversation, but it, it applies kind of across the board. I say that because retargeting is kind of down because like the data is not there, okay? But what is there is on-platform data, which is video views. So if I am turning all my ads into video ads, even if it's just a photo that's looping for five seconds over and over and it just looks like a photo to them, I'm at least able to retarget people who viewed that photo. So the game's kind of changed now. So what we're doing across the board is for the last week and then for the next two weeks essentially, we're changing all our ads to videos so that we can create the biggest possible retargeting pool 
on Facebook that we can because everyone else is going to sit here and try to retarget visitors the last 180 days, purchasers the last 180 days, all these data points that aren't actually accurate and they're, according to iOS, getting like 10%, 15%, 20% of the total people that are actually in those pools. Whereas I'm gonna get 100% because it's all on platform video views. So this is the only way you're guaranteed to retarget. And everything we do is building up height to the launch day. So like one week before we launch a sale, every day is a different ad and a different piece of content. So for example, we'll have like a top of funnel ad that's like the big you know, Black Friday sale coming, very hype, suspenseful, mysterious, what's gonna happen. And anyone that watches that ad is now put into our pool of viewers, purchasers, visitors, where every day, like five to seven days before the sale, they're getting a different ad. It's staying top of mind. I'm beating the crowd. I'm not sitting here and waiting to send a text message to my people to buy. I want them to look forward to the text message. I want them to look forward to the email. I want them, if my email ended up in spam for whatever reason, I want them to have to check their spam inbox because they want it that bad. And so this is kind of how you build that up. So this is kind of strategy one that we're doing for this. I think you guys can kind of implement this across the board. <sighs> strategy two is building like a VVIP list. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. But what we've done, which is pretty cool, we're running a lot of traffic to a Black Friday, Cyber Monday tab on a website that's an actual landing page that's getting people to opt in specifically for this promo. So each brand has their different benefits of opting into this specific list, but it gives us as advertisers the right to basically blast them with way more things than we would normally because they're opting in and they want that. Here's a couple cool things that happens and I'll show you on the next, I think it's the next slide, why we do this and where it changes. But some things that are important, you wanna change the pop-up for all pre-existing subscribers. So like you can make your pop-up based on whatever pop-up platforms you have, say different things based on how people have engaged with you. So if people are already on your email list, they can see a different pop-up than everyone else. And so people that are already on your email list, you wanna change your pop-up to cater towards them, becoming like the VVIP, getting first dibs and things like that. Whereas people who are new customers to you are probably not gonna care as much as the people who are like looking forward to your Black Friday sale to try to buy from you. So change your pop-up so that people engage differently on your site. And then all our email campaigns right now have a footer that says like join our VVIP list for Black Friday. And it, each brand is different. Some brands, they get like the sale the day before. Some brands get more of a discount. Some brands, I'm not gonna spoil it. I'll show you on the other slides kind of what they get. But all these things, we make them all first dibs on SMS only. So our job is to get people to opt in as much as possible to text because I know when Black Friday comes around, I'm gonna get 150 emails on Black Friday and another 200 on Saturday, another 300 on Sunday and Monday. And so I wanna be on the text game here with people. I wanna compete with five other people. I don't wanna compete with 150 other people. So everything that we're driving, all these incentives, we're trying to make them as juicy as possible and drive people to SMS. Tomorrow, Mikey will basically talk to you about that from the Powerhouse Teams group and he'll kind of show you how to be able to use that new list properly when it comes to Black Friday. <sighs> Calendar, this is a must. Again, everyone's being notified from 100 different angles, guys, on like the sales that they're doing. This is like top tier priority. Set up calendar buttons on all your emails, on SMS, on a landing page, whatever it is, and get people to actually add your event to their list. So a couple things that are important that we've fucked up in the past that I don't want you to do the same. Make sure that you're doing it from a company email. So it's not, you know, jack at mastergamer at hotmail.com doing this. So just make sure it's a company email that makes all these events. And then you want to make sure they're all shareable too, just something important. So after you make an event, it's private to your calendar. Go in the settings of that event, make it like publicly shareable, and then anyone can add it to their calendar. Here's the cool part about it. So you do it on Google, Outlook, and Apple so that it covers kind of every category that's possible. The cool part is you can set alerts the exact way that you want. You can have it alert an hour before, 30 minutes before, also six hours before, also the day before, also this, also that. And so everyone's sitting here competing with people on SMS, on email, on all these other platforms. How many people are actually an event on people's calendar? Probably very few. And I've seen most of your calendars and most of you don't even use your calendars properly. So you're not getting 100 notifications a day. You're getting like one, three, maybe four notifications a day. And so when you're getting notified about these sales, it's another channel that you're doing it that isn't very obtrusive to people. It's just a notification. They swipe it. They're used to it every single day. Just no one else is doing it. So you're going to have an advantage. Another thing you want to get like super strategic and tactical. 
you can take this list because it's an it's an email event so you can see all the emails that are in the event right you as as the person who's hosting it you can take them and make them their own list right so you can make a lookalike audience out of them you can put them in their own email sequence you can do whatever you want and treat these people differently and you can exclude them from all your other email blasts that you are still building hype on because they are already kind of in the door right so you can play with this list this is your vvip list so if you get a few hundred, a few thousand people, a few 10,000 people on this list, you guys can be in a really advantageous position when it comes to actual sale day. And then last thing, you can also do a Facebook event. We're doing that on everyone. It takes like five seconds to set up. But if Facebook's also notifying people that a sale is happening, like now I've covered avenues that people aren't even thinking about. And by the time they do, it, they'll have to wait till next Black Friday, Cyber Monday. And so I've already kind of taken advantage of that, of that thing, right? So this is another cool play you guys can have. This is how we did a couple million in a day for those people. Shut down your site for 24 hours before the sale. I know it hurts to lose a day of sales. I promise you all those people are going to buy the next day. Uh, they're going to buy more. So shut down your site for 24 hours before the sale. It's really cool. You can have it password unlocked. So the only way to get in is with a password. Have a timer for when the site actually opens. And here's the play, is all these people that are signing up for your VVIPs, all these lists to get first dibs, you can give them first dibs on the website. You can text them the password six hours before the website goes live and they get to shop first dibs on everything. They can get in before everything sells out. They get the sales before everyone else does. They get full access to everything because a lot of you guys have limited inventory on certain items. They're going to sell out on Black Friday at the end of the day. And if these people know that and they've shopped with you before and they're used to something selling out, they're going to get on that VVIP list, I promise you, and they're going to wait for that text message six hours before the site opens up and they're going to put in that password. They're probably going to tell their friends too because it's password protected. It feels very exclusive. It's not like we're sending them to another landing page or giving them a discount code. It's like you have six hours before everyone else that stands in line to get in the shop and literally clear the shelves with whatever you want and they're going to spend ridiculous amounts of money. So this is how we did it for them back then. We're doing it again on Black Friday and we're probably going to do probably like 2.2, 2.5 mil uh, between those three days that we're going to launch it in. Uh, but closing the site builds up ridiculous amounts of suspense and you can build that same hype through your emails, through everything where like we're going to have to shut down the site because we're loading so many new products or we're discounting everything so heavily that we might crash the site. So we're bringing it down and we're giving our VVIPs six hours early access. This is a very big strategy. Again, people like people psychologically are more afraid to lose something than they are to gain something. It's just how we are as humans. If you find 20 bucks on the couch, it's not a big deal. You're like, oh, sick, 20 bucks, put in your pocket. But if you had 20 bucks, at the end of the day, you're like, where the fuck is my 20 bucks? You start scrambling for it. So it's the same $20 at the end of the day. It's just losing it versus gaining it. So this creates the feeling of loss, okay? Next. And then this one is the best one. If you can do this one, you will make so much fucking money. It's insane. Everyone is selling products. No one is selling experiences, okay? Everyone knows that Black Friday or whatever sale days you guys have are going to be the best days to get the discount, to get the best prices, whatever it is, all these things. But there's nothing else that they can gain from it. So we've gamified it, and we've already started with one of our Black Friday sales, and they've already broken record numbers this month because of this. We haven't even gotten to Black Friday yet, okay? Basically, what we're doing is we're creating a giveaway where people, based on the money they spend, they're gonna get a certain amount of entries into a giveaway. Now, there's certain rules in the United States, just so you know. Any giveaway worth $5,000 or more, or maybe it's over 5,000, whatever, just don't make it 5,000, um, you have to actually register as a sweepstakes officially, and you have to go through a lot of lawyers and laws and certain things like that. So as long as your giveaway is worth less than $5,000, you don't have to do that, okay? Um, so make sure it's less than 5,000 and give people something that they really want. Try not to make it more of your products, okay? If you sell clothing, send them on an all-inclusive trip to the best fashion show or whatever it is, okay? So for example, I'll use one of our brands. They're called Curl Bible. They have two people that are kind of the face of their brand. It's a couple, it's a guy and a girl. They have multiple different businesses. What we did for their giveaway is a day with them. So whoever wins the giveaway gets flown out to Philadelphia. They get to see the office, the warehouse, the team, the actual celebrities that are the owners of the business and be able to hang out with them, talk shop, whatever it is that they want to do with these people. And it is literally going bonkers off the walls with sales right now. 
And so a really cool thing that you can do, for example, keep it simple. You don't need to overcomplicate this. Every dollar that someone spends from X to Y dates literally gets an entry. It's very simple. If you spend $100, you get 100 entries into the giveaway. If you spend 1,000, you get you know, 1,000 entries. Now here's the cool part. You make the first day 2X entries. So for one day only, you tell everyone, hey, this is kind of how it's gonna go down for a week. But the first day you're gonna get two times the entries that anyone else is get on any other day. Any other day, $1 is worth one entry. Today, $1 is worth two entries. And you will see the amount of sales that you will do on that first day is absolutely ridiculous because here's the cool part. We're not incentivizing people to just buy something. We're incentivizing them to spend as many dollars as possible. Like, I don't think you understand the value in that. We have people who in their average orders have only spent 100, 120 bucks on the store, are spending $1,200 just so that they can get 2,400 entries on the first day because they know they're gonna use the products down the road anyways. So this is like really, really front-loading people and everyone else is just bringing prices down, they're doing all these things. No one is selling an experience that you can gain access to that's really big. There's a reason all these companies that give away crazy pickup trucks or Lamborghinis just to buy some shirts and get some entries do well. You can mock that same model with your product and your target market where you don't have to give away a $100,000 car. You can give away something that actually has $4,000 of value and you can absolutely crush this. This is something that I don't see anyone doing this year. And if you guys actually take the time to like sit down for two days and implement this, you will blow everyone else out the water and it will be too late by next year because I promise you next year, you will see a lot of people start picking up the strategy because they saw other people succeed with it the year before. So take advantage of this one. This is one we like try to implement as much as possible across the board with all the brands. Some brands just weren't kind of set up in a way to do something like this, but the ones that are, that we've already started pre-selling for, are, are like absolutely crushing every single monetary goal that they had because everyone's already buying the product, everyone's already getting a discount, but no other person is messaging you saying, win a trip and hang out with the founders for the day, go to Italy for a day and see our factory, whatever it is. So create an experience that it's tied to and you will, you will find out how many people love to buy lottery tickets after this, okay? Next. Other offers that work, just some cool things you can kind of try. A couple brands we're doing that have a lot of products. We're doing one sale a day for seven days and you don't know what it is. So clothing brand, example I used. You know, t-shirts are on sale on Friday. Shirts are gonna be on Saturday. Hats are gonna be on Sunday. And they are flooring the prices. So it's like, it's pretty cool because you don't know what it's gonna be. And so you know that item is not gonna be on sale to that degree after that day. And so you're gonna see people buying multiple days back to back just to get access to kind of all those things and you can kind of figure out who's your VIPs from that. Upgrading bundles automatically is, is a cool one. If you have different sizes, you can always upgrade people's sizes. I'm doing that in some of my businesses like wall art businesses and things like that. We're upgrading people from like a large to an extra large for free and things like that. You, you'd be surprised how much value that brings to people because in their head, they're saving like 60, 70 bucks. But for you from a cost of goods sold standpoint, you're, you're probably paying like seven, eight dollars more on that margin of size, right? So this is a very beneficial one for you because the bigger you get, the less cost of goods you have per ounce. Very, very structured, uh, very, very effective. This next one's probably my favorite one on the list, tiered cash back, here's why. You can be way more aggressive with tiered cash back than you can with discounts, it's not even close. So example, spend hundred dollars, get 30, okay? This is a very weak example, but you can, for example, other people are doing 40% off their store, you could do spend $100 and get $50 back. To them, that's 50% off. But to you, what it really is, is you're giving them $50 cash that they're gonna now spend with you again. You have your cost of goods, so you're not actually giving them $50, you're probably giving them 15, 20 bucks out of your own pocket. So you're not having to discount your stuff half off. And what it does is it pushes people to spend more because that percentage is gonna keep getting bigger. So I wanna spend 350 bucks because I know I'm gonna get $200 cash back on $350, I'm trying to break that threshold. So make them very aggressive numbers because you, what people aren't factoring in is your cost of goods here. If you give a percentage off, that's cash that you're just bleeding out of your pocket. Here you're giving people what feels like a lot more to them and you're tiering it so they wanna spend more. But at the end of the day, you're saving so much money as a business owner and you can be way more aggressive with the structure. And then last one, tiered free products. You've seen this everywhere. Spend X, you know, spend X, get Y you know, spend more and get more stuff for free too. So a couple other things there. Uh, if you care to connect, that's my Instagram. That's my company's Instagram. You know, I'd love for you guys to follow us. That's all I really ask. I'm not here to sell you anything, but 
you know, I think we put out some pretty dope content, I think, that can help you guys out. So feel free to follow. Is that it? Do we have time for questions or do we have any questions? Uh, for hello, hello. Uh, for strategy number five on the giveaway, mm -hmm. um, how are you tracking this, and how are you um, actually running the giveaway? Okay, so it's not that hard. It's just based on dollars spent per customer. So at the end of this period, you're gonna basically CSV file or Excel file these things out of your business, and you're gonna have someone take a weighted total of everything, and you're gonna see who has however many entries. You can put them in a randomizer. It's done. It's not that hard. It's just because you're you're tying it to the dollar spent. So as long as you can export your orders, you can see who has how many entries. Very simple. You just need someone on Excel. And if you're not good on Excel, you don't have like a CFO, get someone on Fiverr, be like, here's what I want to do with this file. They'll literally pull it for you. And then you can just put it in a randomizer, run it live on Facebook. Everyone sees it live. Boom, we pick the winner. Yeah. Who else? I saw some other hands. So I want to the platform. Mm-hmm. Advertising platforms, right? So if you had to pick one to start with, yeah, where would you start? Oh, what's your product? Uh, sleep. Sleep products. Sleep, sleep supplements. Google. If, if they let you sell. So, again, supplements is kind of a weird place in a lot of, like, Snapchat, TikTok. Snapchat, you'll get away with it. TikTok, no chance. You're selling a sleep supplement, not happening on TikTok, guaranteed. So like find the platforms that work. You want to figure out is your product like buyer intent heavy or do you need to show someone the problem for them to understand it? You get what I'm saying? You can you can kind of think for yourself like is my product something people are Googling a solution for so that I am the solution? If it is, that's where I would start because you're going to see the highest ROAS on Google for sure. And then from there you can take that extra dollars that you have to kind of push Facebook. Again, start thinking of Facebook and all these platforms like billboards were back in the day. These are attention heavy platforms. So you want to get people's attention, but you shotgunning people about sleep pills is not going to be as powerful as you just letting people come to you saying, I have sleep problems. You get what I'm saying? We have a brand we do marketing for called Relaxium. They do like 13, 14 million a month, sleep pills only, TV. So just letting you know, you'd be surprised. But if I had it and I was like, Bootstrapping myself, I'd go Google first and then take it from there. Uh, you had your hand up. Dynamic product ads, broad audiences. Dynamic product ads, what? what was the last the broad audiences, so using like DPAs. 100%. But not That's what I, that first slide I showed you, dynamic product ads was the second to last bullet point. That's working phenomenally, especially with people who have a ton of different designs and things like that. I'll come right back to you. You had your hand up, right? So I heard you mention that Facebook is not tracking correctly uh, multiple times. So are you using things like high rows? Yes. So transparency, I am in high rows is higher, highest level mastermind. I see how the software is built, all these things. We are trying to move away from high rows because it is actually not tracking properly anymore. Um, yes. Wicked reports though. I got to give it to them. We've been using it with a few clients um, and it's been, it's been working pretty well. High rows works very well for like leads they're having some trouble with actual e-commerce purchases right now. And the problem with High Rose 2, it's a great software, don't get me wrong, we've been using it for like eight months at this point. Problem with High Rose is it stops at an audience level. You can't like, on High Rose, you kind of stop at like the audience level. Wicked Reports, I can pull up an ad and it'll show me like every single product that was purchased from that ad. You know, like people clicked on this design and like we sold 15 of these design, we sold 10 of these, we sold six of these from this ad itself. So yes, I would use Wicked Reports. As a business owner, at the end of the day, you wanna have all your UTMs and parameters cleaned up anyways through Google Analytics. So like your worst case scenario should be Google Analytics. The problem is Google Analytics is only last click. So if someone saw a thousand ads and then clicked on one last one, on Google Analytics, that's the only one that's getting credit. So just some things to kind of keep in mind when you're exploring. Does that answer the question? Cool. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, just a few quick questions. Um, I really love all the strategies that you used. Um, it seems like these are one-offs. Have you ever tried to evergreen them so you can kind of keep them going year-round? For these? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, we have clients whose entire business is a giveaway. Mm. Like literally every six weeks, we have to spend a million dollars in ads to be able to break even or profit for them because their entire model is 
buy stuff from our site and get entries. Mm. So a lot of these are evergreen strategies that have never been used on like sale days. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, something like shutting the store down for a, a day. You can do that as long as you're dropping products every month, example. Otherwise, what are you shutting down the store for? Mm. You get what I'm saying? So, mm. yeah, a lot of these are evergreen, especially this one. If you just type in like car giveaway businesses, you'll find hundreds right now online. Mm. And everyone's trying to do it because it's like it's working very well. But yeah. iOS definitely hurt them a lot. But I don't mm. know if that answers your question. That does. I guess specifically for this giveaway one, are you running ads to the giveaway? Just kind of evergreen and like. Yeah. So we run to ads to a store. So example, we're giving away a pickup truck souped up dodge ram whatever all our content is around the car it's not around what's bought on the store it doesn't matter this is like a lottery ticket you got to sell them on the big number on the billboard which is the car car plus cash for example so yes we do that that works very well the problem is you got to compensate for the car so like a lot of us just have cost of a good sold and ads warehouse costs whatever it is fulfillment these guys start negative 180 grand mm. you know what i mean so you got to spend ridiculous amounts of money in a short time to make it feasible. And any giveaway over $5,000 has to be registered with like as an official sweepstakes in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Because it has to be no purchase necessary. I'm sure you see that all the time, yeah. no purchase necessary. There's people whose literally only jobs in life is to have tons of people mailing in entries by hand. Because in order for it to be an official sweepstakes, people should be able to mail a letter that says entry. And then you have to give them an entry into the giveaway. Mm -hmm. So... It's a very, very good strategy. If you do ever go into this model, something really cool you can do. And this is something that you can kind of like replicate in this giveaway model in a short time too. Um, but basically what, which actually is a good idea now that I'm thinking about it. So basically what we do after someone buys, let's say they buy and it's 5X week. We say, hey, listen, there's never a 25X week in this entire giveaway, but here's a code and it expires in the time that the giveaway ends. And you can use this code post-purchase email you can use this code to get 25x entries on any purchase you make. Mm. So what they do, it's always their biggest purchase. It's not even fucking close. It's like four or five x their last purchase because they're getting 25 times entries and they can never have it any time mm. else, right? Mm -hmm. So they wait to the end just to make sure we're not lying. They see 15, they see 20, they see 10, but they never see 25. And then the last four days, I don't know if they gather all their family members or if they're <laughs> shopping for Christmas like six months ahead of time, but they'll put in an order that's like four or five X their last order size so that they can get the most amount of, mm -hmm. of entries. Mm -hmm. This entire model is not based around what you're selling. It's what they're winning. Mm -hmm. That's it. So that's why, that's why it's so cool. These people sell like t-shirts with really shitty designs that you would never buy. Yeah. Actually, I'll tell you, I'll tell you how much it's about the product that you're winning. The most purchased product on their entire store is a digital poster of the car that has no tangible value. It's almost like a donation, hmm. okay? And it, it, it accounts for 40% of the store's revenue, and they're buying something that they get nothing in return. Just, they're literally gambling. It's just a legal way to do it. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know if that kind of gives you some insights on this one. Yeah, no, this whole thing is really crazy. I feel like this, this strategy alone is like so, you can evergreen it in really creative ways, and it can just like really level up a business. Um, so that's really cool, thank you. Um, second question is, do you ever dabble in connected TV? Connected TV? Yeah. I've been asked to dabble in connected TV, um, but I haven't. I like that connected TV has like ads managers that you can manage. Um, so the last few months I've experimented with conversations. I've been through the dashboards. I have logins. I can kind of see how the platform works. But a lot of these guys have like minimum commitments. Like, hey, we need, you know, 30 grand a month for six months. And, you know, a lot of smart business owners are not willing to fork out 180K mm. with no idea of what's actually happening to a degree of like ROAS and things like that when their entire company has been structured that way for the last X amount of years. Mm. So I haven't yet. I've, I've played with Hulu more than I have with that. Um, and I've seen pretty good success on Hulu. Cool. Awesome. Great and then question. the last quick one is yeah. um, to go back to that tiered cash back strategy. Yeah. How are you structuring that? Like just like logistically, like are you doing cash back or is it like a gift card? Like how you kind of... Yeah, yeah, it's a gift card on the store. Um, mm -hmm. It's always gift card on the store, and it's X amount of time before you have to use it. So, oh, example, you have to use it by January 31st, and here's how much it is. So mm -hmm. you as a business can predictively know 
we have $150,000 of gift cards out that are gonna be spent in the next 60 days. So just be prepared from an inventory standpoint and from a profit margin standpoint, mm. there's 150,000 of, of cash coming in that is an actual cash collected. I see, I see, okay, cool. sorry, gift, they're expiring gift cards. Yes, exactly, 100%. Right, thank you. Yeah, so the question is, um, do we test advertorials with no prices versus landing page with prices 100%? Um, I, I've actually, we've been pretty aggressive split testing, like a two step where they have to enter something to find the price versus just showing them the price. They vary week by week, to be honest. Um, but when we look at the net over like four weeks at a time, something that doesn't show the price on the first page and shows it on the second page has won majority of the time. And so, yeah. Um, you can use, I mean, we use ClickFunnels, we use SamCart. There's a lot of these different softwares that do stuff like that. Yeah, it's all just like funnel-based softwares. I got time for one more. Anyone? Perfect. Well, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. I hope that was helpful. If you've gotten this far in this video, that means you're pretty serious about your e-commerce store and getting results on Black Friday, Cyber Monday, which is why me and my team have put together this 40-page guide walking through everything you need to know about email and SMS for Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Let me show you a couple of these things here so you really understand how crazy this is. I'm talking everything, 40 pages of exact segmentation, exact buildup of height. I mean, look at this. Look at this right here, an exact calendar of when to send, who to send it to, how many emails to send, down to the exact strategy we use on ads, as well as email and SMS to get the results that we want across all the hundreds of accounts that we manage. With that being said, I want to give you all of that for watching this video just for a single dollar. All you have to do is just click in the description below, click the link to get this entire Black Friday Cyber Monday guide for just one dollar. For anyone that owns an e-com store, this is the absolute best spend of a dollar you can use. I can't even remember the last time I spent as little as a dollar to buy anything. I mean, for Christ's sake, my McDouble costs a dollar and 60 cents nowadays, maybe even two bucks. Go ahead, click the link below, take advantage of this Black Friday, Cyber Monday email guide, 40 pages of absolute gold nuggets that'll change the rest of your life and hopefully make you tons and tons and tons of money if you use these strategies below. Thanks again for watching.